many things. He had been working with Mordecai. Now, you see, Mordecai was a guard. And while he was guarding the gate, he overheard two men, and these men were plotting to kill the king. And so he sent word to Naomi, and Naomi in turn went and told the king about this plot, and it was turned out. Now, he didn't, the king didn't do anything for Mordecai. He evidently quickly forgot about that, didn't give thanks. But then one night, he couldn't sleep. And this, again, is no coincidence. God's hand is found throughout the book, even though his name is not mentioned. He couldn't sleep, and he got, got up, and he started reading the ledgers. The ledgers describe the activities of the day. And as he was reading these chronicles, he read about how Mordecai had saved his life. And so he said, well, I, I need to reward him. I never rewarded Mordecai for what he had done. And so he called Haman, and he said, Haman, if I have somebody that has served me and has served the kingdom well, what should I do? And he said, well, parade him through town and let all the people know uh, his honor because of what he has done. And uh, Haman, actually, he actually thought that he was the one. Who else should receive the gratitude of the king but him? And the king said, well, go get Mordecai and take him through the town and let everybody honor him. And so he was forced to do this. You know, his gut must have been wrenched in doing that. He hated it, but he was probably consoling himself with the knowledge that on March the 7th, uh, he was going to be killed along with all the other Jews, and he was not going to be receiving honor much longer. Mordecai was a wise counselor. And you know, all of us seek wise counsel as well. I, I know over the years, sometimes I've gone to people for counsel uh, in my personal life, and I've gone to pastors that were more experienced than I about things to do within the church and it's always great to receive wise counsel and you almost always you know if that counsel is good or not but the greatest counselor of all is our Lord Jesus Christ and in Isaiah 9 6 Jesus is called there the wonderful counselor and he's not like uh you know, these counselors that don't give any direction, the non-directive ones that, that give kind of sort of a grunt and just keep the people talking, thinking that they can solve their problems themselves. Jesus actually gave advice. He gave advice on how to be happy in life. He gave advice on marriage, on lust, on anger, on worry, on a host of other things. And you and I, our, our lives are directed to following the advice that he gives. When I was uh, working in the prison, uh, I became an assistant warden, first of all. And as an assistant warden, it was my job to supervise like eight different departments. And one of those was medical. And in, as a practice, I did the PA on the medical doctor that worked at the prison. Well, one day, that doctor, who was a Christian, uh, was called along with me to answer for something that he had done, and we were called to the head warden's office, and the warden asked him about that, and I can remember the response the doctor gave. He said, you know, I'm a Christian, and I made the decision to do the right thing. That's what I always want to do, is the right thing. And I've thought about that statement over the years. And that's the purpose of each one of us, isn't it? To do the right thing from the counsel of Christ as nearly as possible to follow in obedience to his perfect will. So we have Mordecai, and he is the wise counselor. And finally, we have a silent voice, and that is God. So sometimes we ask, where is God? Does he not hear us? Uh, does he not speak to us? Why is it that God sometimes is silent? Well, I think one reason, and we talked about this on, on Wednesday, we had our little Bible study, and we were talking about this a, be, a bit. And one of the things is that God wants for us to live by faith. The Bible says it is impossible to please God apart from faith. 
is something even a child can have. Jesus said to come to him, you must come like a little child. Perfect faith. And if you're too wise, sometimes you're too wise to have faith in God. It comes for the rich and for the poor. So faith is a great equalizer. If God came and sat down with you and talked with you person to person every day, it wouldn't require much faith, would it? We don't understand all the dimensions of that, but God is a God that requires faith. And then also it enables us to be able to know the mind of Christ. With my deceased wife, we were married for 45 years, and I would be making decisions, I'd have to, a big decision I had to make, and she would tell me, uh, you want me to tell you what you're gonna do? I said, absolutely not. I've got to work this out for myself. I don't want you telling me what I'm gonna do. And so I would sometimes go through the list of positives and negatives and finally come to a conclusion she said, would you like for me to tell you now what you're going to do? I said, yeah, go ahead. And she would tell me, and you know what? She was right. How annoying that is. <laughs> See, we were married for 45 years, and after all that time, she knew intuitively what I was going to do. And in the same way as you work with God, you live with God, you pray to God, you come to know the mind of Christ. And if he were there sitting in a chair talking to you, uh, it would, you wouldn't be struggling uh, to find his will. And then finally, sometimes God does not speak so that we can develop the, the mind of the heart. You know, Paul said uh, in Ephesians 1, 7, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened, may be enlightened the eyes of the heart. You know, we're born with five senses, and, you know, my, my wife, Anna, tells me that women have a sixth sense. Sometimes it seems to be operational, that sixth sense, but, but there's another sixth sense. If you're going to communicate with God, you have to speak and listen with the eyes of the heart. Uh, the Bible tells us that faith is the evidence of things not seen. So God usually does not appear to us physically, and He usually does not speak to us audibly, but God does speak to us with the eyes of the heart. Well, in our Bible study on Wednesday, uh, there was the girl that was here last Sunday, Esmeralda. And she was in prison for 14 years in Guadalajara. And during that time, she became somewhat discouraged because she was praying, asking God to, to give her release. And God seemed silent for a long time. And one day, she was walking around, and she said, God, please speak to me. Tell me something about when I might be released. And she said it, it was like an arrow struck her. And God confirmed to her that soon... She was going to be released. And she said, at that very moment, things started happening. And very soon, she was out of prison, and she's been living uh, in uh, Mexico City for the last two years or so. And, you know, I, the peop some of the people in our church actually had a, a hand in helping her to get out. And I know that she's grateful for that. But more than anything else, it was God that was working. So even when God is silent in our lives... That does not mean that God is absent. God is still working. And as we look at Esther, we see God's hand throughout. Even though God's name is not mentioned, God was still there. God was still working. He was working when Esther became the queen. He was working through Mordecai uh, so that he might be in a position to give counsel. Uh, he was even working with Haman and with the king himself. God was in control, and he was working even when he seemed to be silent. And so after three days of fasting, Esther went before the king. And to her great relief, he lifted up the scepter. <laughs> he loved her. And he said, what can I do for you? And she said, well, you can come to a banquet. I'm going to have a banquet for you and for Haman. And so he said, okay. So 
she evidently prepared the meal and they came and had the meal it was a wonderful meal and he said well what what do you need and she said well I'd like for you to come to another banquet <laughs> uh, I guess she understood that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach and so he came again had a great meal and he said okay tell me now what is it that you want and she said I have some bad news I'm going to be killed along with all the other Jews. Now, he did not know she was Jewish, and Haman did not know that she was Jewish. And so Xerxes said, well, who in the world would kill my queen? And she pointed to Haman and said, that's the man. So Xerxes went out on the balcony to think for a minute, and Haman realized at that point he was in some serious trouble. And so he was crawling on his knees before her. She was on the couch, and he was begging her to do something about it. The king came in and saw him, and he said, What, would you molest my wife? He said, Take that man to his guard. Take that man and hang him right now. Now, he had already prepared a 75-foot pole for Mordecai, and he was hanged on the very pole that he had prepared. As a result of that, Mordecai became his right-hand man. He took Haman's place. And on March the 7th, Mordecai was able to prepare everything so that nothing would happen to the Jews. He gave them weapons to defend themselves, and he told all the politicians and officials and the soldiers, you protect them on this day that they will not be killed. God was involved in all of this. Even during the time that he was silent, God was still working. God was doing something. And I, I think for all of us, we have the question posed to us that was posed by Mordecai to Esther. And that is, maybe you are here today. Maybe I am here today by the hand of God. Maybe you are here for just such a time as this. While I was still chaplain at the prison before becoming a warden, there was a new secretary of corrections that was appointed. The other one had retired. And I happened to be with him about the time that he found out. And so he and I were talking. He knew that I was a chaplain. And he said, you know... It seems to me that this is a real opportunity to make some positive changes in corrections in Louisiana. And I pointed out to him about Esther in the Old Testament and said that she was there for just such a time as this. And I said to him, maybe you are here today for just such a time as this. I came to Mexico something over five years ago. Wasn't planning on being a pastor. I thought that I had, you know, done my service and it was time for me to come here and retire. But then I learned when the, the church asked me to be the pastor of congregational care, I felt, oh, well, that's not too bad. I think I can handle that. But I was there for just such a time as this. And then Pastor Ross passed away Really had to think about that, but realized, yeah, I'm probably here for just such a time as this. Sometimes God calls upon us to do the difficult thing. Why are you here in Shapala? And what does God want for you to do with your life? Would you bow with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day. God, our great desire is to follow you, to know you. And even though we don't always hear your voice with an audible voice, we know when you speak to us. And we pray, God, that we might follow through and always do the right thing. Thank you for your grace, your wisdom, your guidance in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen.